the call to order and the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Here. Councilor Johnson. Here. Councilor Foley. Here. Councilor Katerina. Here. Councilor Donovan. Here. Councilor Hamill. Here. Chairman Hayes. Here. Um, I think the next item on the agenda is general public comments and what we're going to do this evening. I, I suspect a lot of you might be here to share your, your views and comments about the revaluation process. But before we allow everybody to kind of come up, I think the town manager has some introductory remarks and sharing some of the things that have occurred and, and where we are. So yeah, that time, I'd, I'd like to speak to a couple of uh, the process things and where we've been and where we're going from here. Uh, just uh, indulge me for a moment. I'll, I'll just take a step backward. Last year, the town accomplished commercial industrial revaluation, and in the in the budget, we budgeted monies for uh, accomplishing a full residential revaluation this year. That work started last fall. We selected a, an outside professional company to assist us, and over the course of eight months, uh, they've attempted to um, inspect uh, all 8,800 residential properties. Now. In the end, I think they were able to get in uh, perhaps 50% of them. I'll have more exact uh, specifics. Uh, I'm told that that's actually a fairly good number from their perspective. Um, that work was completed by our consultant uh, the 1st of August or so, and all of us town residents received notices regarding uh, proposed new valuations on our properties. And that really started a, a process that's gone in earnest over the last three or four weeks now. Uh, our consultant had a total of 12 days uh, fully staffed, and some days they had five uh, different listers here meeting with residents. I don't have the final numbers, but I think we're approaching a thousand different meetings or hearings were held. Uh, beyond that, town staff was able to interact with uh, folks as they were coming and going and waiting for appointments uh, and had some really good conversations. Uh, that whole process is really critically important to the process. It's, it's part of the quality control. Um, many of the conversations I can report, uh, they, I think all were cordial and, and professional. Uh, in many cases, uh, there was a validation that what was done was, was right. In other cases, uh, there were problems uh, with uh, uh, information on the property card that was identified, and that's all part of the, the, the design here. Our consultant took good notes uh, of those meetings, uh, and as of last night, um, uh, corrected all of those things that they became aware of through the course of that process. At the same time, our assessing department was doing its own review of uh, our consultant's work. And through the course of that, there were a couple of areas identified and I've uh, advised uh, the council in the past and the public. Um, some of the beach areas, Higgins Beach in particular, something seemed to be a bit strange on the land values uh, that warrant a further look. Uh, and the Hill, Hillcrest and Pinecrest communities uh, equally uh, saw some different, uh, some, some changes. And so during the course of this time, in addition to the work and the changes our consultants have done, uh, most importantly our assessor is overseeing all of the work and has uh, moved forward and is making some final adjustments. All of this will culminate at the end of the week uh, where we expect to set uh, the tax commitment and the tax rate as part of that. And then what will follow would be the normal uh, mailing of bills uh, and and, and so on and so forth. Um, just as a general comment, I, I, I've been pleased generally with the, the quality of the work. Uh, clearly a mass appraisal approach uh, is a fairly blunt instrument. This is not a surgical appraisal of each property comparing comparable uh, properties. It's just not physically possible. And so in the course of that sort of approach, uh, you know, some things are lost. And so we're, we're pleased to make those corrections. Those are the easy things. If we have missed parts of your, or, or reported the elements of your property incorrectly, those are either easy things to change. We have changed them and we'll continue to. So the next phase of the process, once the uh, taxes are committed, um, taxpayers, as they always have, you have the right uh, to pursue an abatement. Uh, if you still think your value is incorrect, there's a, a, a formal process you can follow. The good news is that starts with the assessor. That's the first step. And the assessor has indicated, and I'm offering this on his behalf, uh, his willingness to, to meet with taxpayers really on an informal basis and 
we're hopeful that we can work through any differences at that level and not require formal applications and so on and so forth. And uh, so I strongly encourage folks to avail themselves of that resource uh, going forward should you still have questions or concerns. Um, I should also uh, provide a, a bit of an apology. Uh, I did a, a, an interview with one of the local um, news stations yesterday, much uh, against my better judgment, but nonetheless I did it. And I, I made a statement that I, I said, so I need to own it. Uh, but I, I want to make sure that you appreciate the context. Uh, the conversation was around the fact that in most cases, revaluations, the end result is a third go up and a third say the same and a third go down. And it looks as though in Scarborough, because of the length of time it's taken us between revaluations and frankly the, the very hot and sustained real estate market that we all ha have seen here, uh, it appears as though most will be going up in one degree or another, some more than others. And so in the context of that discussion, what I said was, the good news is our house values are going up, and uh, the bad news is we have to find a way to, to stay in them. And I apologize if that was taken as a callous statement. Um, uh, it's the reality of the, the, the cruel truth of the property tax. It is totally blind to someone's ability to pay. Uh, so for that, I apologize. Um, certainly didn't mean to offend anyone in that comment. Um, Perhaps it's best if I stop there and, and I could answer questions from council if, if there are things on your mind. Uh, do you, so I, if I heard this correct, geez, these, are, these are loud today. Um, residents do not have to file a formal abatement in the beginning because they can meet one on one with the tax assessor, correct? Yes, he's okay. indicated his willingness to, to do it on an informal basis first. So informal meaning there's not a whole lot of barriers. Somebody can walk in and just say, here's my situation. Help me if, if, it, if it merits help. Yes, in fact, I, I should have mentioned that uh, we intend to do a full campaign, um, perhaps enlist the uh, communications committee to make sure we're hitting all the bases around the abatement process and how to navigate through that. Uh, so that will be starting as soon as next week. And do you know how long the assessor has agreed to maintain the f informal part of the abatement process? Have you guys set a date? Is it 15 days, 30 days? Is it until? Uh, under Maine law, uh, all taxpayers have 180 days to file an abatement. Okay. So it's okay. up to them whenever they initiate. Uh, I expect because it's front of mind for folks, we'll see a lot of that activity continue right along. Uh, but they can wait as long as 180 days. Okay, and last thing, and I, I'm not expecting you to commit to anything, but if something is egregiously wrong, it's, a, it's possible that you can have a 15-minute meeting and that egregious error can get taken care of and you can walk out the door feeling a, better. If there are factual differences, I only have two bedrooms and you have me at four, yeah. those are very easy. Those will essentially be done on the spot. Okay. There are other cases where it's a little more complicated sure. and he may not be able to offer an opinion quite as quickly, but uh, when, when it's factual-based, I think you'll see quick resolution. Thank you. I had a follow-up question to that. I mean, it's promising that uh, uh, the assessor and uh, the town manager has, has just explained that there would be an additional period for people to approach the assessor one-on-one -on -one, uh, to have errors fixed and possibly to get things uh, adjusted, mm -hmm. and that that would not uh, prohibit them from following the uh, abatement process. In order to help um, residents take advantage of that. Um, how do we plan to communicate it, number one? And number two, um, will we be mailing detailed property cards to all residents so they have all the information they need in order to make sure that that informal meeting is as productive as possible? There are no current plans to mail property cards to each homeowner. Uh, that's certainly something we could consider. There's a, a cost associated uh, as part of this process, we have subscribed to the Vision software, which provides uh, a great deal of information. It has been pointed out to us that the version of the property card that's available online, there are there's some pieces of the property card not reflected. And uh, that was essentially Vision, they provide the service to uh, dozens and dozens of communities, and they found that the collection of information on the card that we're now supporting is what most places want. Uh, we've actually spoken to them and we'll be able to share up uh, the, uh, all the information on the property card within about two weeks. Um, so we have an motion. Uh, but uh, at this point, there's no plans to do direct mailings to homeowners, no. 
Yeah, I'd like us to consider that, and I, I'm not going to speak for the council, but I'd like us as a council to think about that is in our efforts to redirect and try to, you know, do a cleanup phase here, uh, you know, in the next several days. I know we're doing this on an informal basis, but I think that everyone needs to be made aware of that opportunity, um, you know, given there was a wide variety of experiences with the informal appraisal, meet, the informal appeals process that we started with. Councilor Kennedy? Yeah, if I could make a suggestion, Councilor Hamill, rather than just doing a mailing to every property owner, because I think a majority of property owners can go online and get their property cards, but I would suggest that if people don't have online access or don't prefer not to use that, if we could have some way they could um, contact us and we will mail it to them, that they don't have to come in if they can't make it in here. That certainly would be reasonable. Yeah, I mean, to add on to that, maybe um, you establish a threshold where if your values change by more than 40% or 30%, somewhere around there, you, you mail a note with a property card to those property holders to make sure that everything's accurate. I think that's a, kind of a reasonable compromise. And then you're not mailing 9,000 right. letters. It's my, my hunch is we've had uh, fairly deep conversations, either staff or consultant, with folks that have seen uh, increases in their value. But Certainly not all. I should mention, just as a word of warning to all of us, uh, it's incumbent on all of us as property owners to make sure that, I, that information is accurate. It's not just an issue this year. That's true in any year. So I strongly encourage you to be aware of what's on that card. Um, keep in mind, there are some houses, half the houses, we didn't get inside of. And so we're, we're relying on data that we had that could be 14 years old. So uh, it's not as though if, if there's missing information, it's not as though our consultant made a mistake. It's that we use the best information we have. So please, by all means, uh, look at your card, make sure that we have it accurate. Anyone else? So I guess with that, um, anybody that's welcome to step forward for public comment, please come to the podium and just give us your name and address, please. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jacob Smith. I'm a resident of uh, Scar Road, 45 Chamberlain Road. Also, um, one of the owners at State Manufactured Homes, as well as Hillcrest Retirement Community and Pinecrest Community in Scar Road. Um, so, two weeks ago, when the new valuations were announced, I think we were all a little bit shocked at the increases. Um, some were justifiable given, uh, <laughs> given 14 years of no valuation. But for our 500 residents at uh, Hillcrest and Pinecrest combined, uh, we saw increases of 80% to 120 to 190%. Um, it was an impossible pill to swallow, honestly. To us, the owners of the community, um, it was obvious that the land was included in the value of the homes. In a manufactured housing community, that's not the case. Um, that's what keeps the housing affordable, is to not include the value of the lot. After several back and forth meetings with the town manager, Mr. Hall, Tax Assessor, Mr. Buhard, and KRT. It was determined that KRT was trying to get the sale price of the home. It was clear that the methodology to determine these numbers was incorrect. Everyone in the office at State Manufactured Homes spent days doing the NADA reports for the entire communities of Hillcrest and Pinecrest. A little bit of background, NADA reports are JD, JD Power certified valuation process for used cars, manufactured homes, and any other title items. It's how we get the value of homes for used houses that are coming out of the community. After 500 plus reports were found, uh, we found the NADA reports reflected the actual value of the home and not the new valuations done by KRT. Mr. Buffard has listened to the concerns of our residents and worked very hard to determine the fa fair values of the unique form of housing that we have in Hillcrest and Pinecrest. Late this afternoon, we received the updated valuations list from him, and although we can't speak for the residents individually, the valuations, by and large, seem to reflect the just value of these homes. So I just wanted to thank you, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi. My name is Mo Erickson. I have a visual. Mm I think a visual is better than just me blabbing out a bunch of numbers. I, I want everyone to see it. This 
especially you guys, so you can stare at those numbers like I've been staring at them. I've been staring at them for a couple of weeks now. As you can see, the, my property assessment went up 91%. 91%. I think I did put a new roof on, and I think I got a new toilet paper holder. 91%. Hmm. Wow. 254000 to $486,000. My other visual, my taxes, based on the proposed or this, you know, the speculated fourteen dollars and thirty-five cents, are going to go up eighty percent, from three thousand eight hundred sixty-five dollars and twenty-six cents, to six thousand nine hundred seventy-eight dollars and forty cents, almost double. I remember being here a couple of years ago complaining about 3 and 4%. That seemed like a dream in comparison now. Before I came here, my two boys said to me, Mom, please don't sound like such a crabby B-I-T-C-H like you always do when you go up there. I said, well, you know what? I'm really mad this time. I'm really mad, you know, redheads are famous for their temper. I mean, you should, if, if you came close enough to me, you probably could see the smoke coming out of my ears. This is shameful. How can you run a town and not have a reassessment for 14 years and do this to the people that live in this town? Shame on the town manager, the town planner, the town, everybody. We rely on you people to make good decisions, and this is what you sock us with. Shame on all of you. How are we going to live here? Like I said to my boys, well, hopefully, you know, in the next one or two years, I'm sure there's going to be lots of houses for sale. So hopefully you'll be able to buy one. I doubt you'll be able to afford it, of course. And then even if you could, God knows you're not going to be able to stay in it and pay your taxes. Shame on all of you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Mary Ann Pasolak, where I reside at 9 Vesper Street in Higgins Beach. Um, we were just reassessed four years ago, and before that, it was three years. So my first point is the beach is being targeted. Um, we bought there 26 years ago to retire there, and now that is being taken away from us because of the horrendous increase in taxes is ridiculous and also inaccurate. They have, I came in and talked to them, and I'm wondering if they're going to make the changes. They have me down as a full basement. I don't have a full basement. It's a crawl space. You can barely crouch down in there. Also, when people um, try to do any additions or anything and they come up before they're told, no one owns the view. So if you build in front of somebody and they're upset, well, nobody owns the view. Well, then why does the town own the view? Because that's what you're basing this tax on, how close you are to the water. <coughs> and with that, FEMA came in last year, redid the whole beach, put our properties into a much worse flooding zone. So the flood insurance goes up dramatically. Now to me, that's not an improvement to my property, that's a hindrance. That's a devaluation, not an increase in it. And I just think it's a shame that um, after all these years, having to lose our dream to retire here because of greed of certain people. And 
the whole town may not have been valued for 20 years, but the beach has been hit consecutively, and it's just not right. I'm sorry. I'm Susan Hamill, and I live on Bay Street in Pine Point. After reading the recent Portland Press Herald article about Scarborough's assessment, I looked at the Bath, the Town of Bath's website because a reader had posted comments about their assessment process, and highlighted right up front on the assessing department's homepage there was this message to taxpayers. As a Bath property owner, you play a crucial role in the success of our citywide evaluation. You are the last fact check on our descriptions of your property, which are the basis of our evaluations. Please review the information we have on your property and let us know if there are errors. We want to ensure that your property is valued correctly. I contrast that with Scarborough. Taxpayers were sent a notice with two figures, the old and the new assessment. No property card, nothing more. It wouldn't have cost anything more to send. I mean, you're paying for the stamp already. Um, the summary information online does not include the detail necessary for most homeowners to verify that the lister got the right information. We had two weeks to check the information, meet with KRT, and try to get corrections made. The town couldn't have made it much more difficult for homeowners. My meeting with the KRT rep was very discouraging. He seemed uninterested in what we were saying, took almost no notes, disappeared for at least five minutes of my 15-minute meeting to go get the property card, and I have no, no real hope of any, any adjustments in my assessment being made as a result of that meeting. I understand that other taxpayers had more positive experiences, but many, many sounded just like mine. I live in Pine Point, an area where most houses are non-conforming, on very small lots, jammed together. We were all, they were built before zoning. One big issue I see is that the land values have dropped in Pine Point according to the revaluation. Particularly the marginal value of having additional land. And I'm not talking about huge parcels. I'm referring to having a little extra space to park a car, uh, squeeze in a swing set, or put up a clothesline. Having a little extra in an area like this is very valuable. And at Pine Point, it's probably the same as true at Higgins. But under this new system, the value of additional space has been given very little weight. I've com compared the assessed value of different size lots in the old and new systems, and the outcomes just don't make sense. Additionally, the new <coughs> system has added a scenic view index. This is very subjective, and no information is available on how it was determined. In fact, without your property card, you probably wouldn't even know that there is now a scenic view index, because it doesn't appear in the summary information. I know that taxpayers in Pine Point other taxpayers have issues with their assessments, and I'm concerned about the ad hoc changes being made to individual assessments without looking at more global issues involving neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods like Pine Point. And I'm not talking about specific inaccuracies on the property card, wrong number of bedrooms, and that type of thing. But we have no process here to identify and solve these kind of global issues. And I'm sure there are other neighborhoods that have similar similar issues. At this point, we know that there were a lot of mistakes, and it's been confirmed by the town manager. Taxpayers deserve to feel confident that their assessment is correct, especially relative to everyone else. So I'm asking for a few things. Um, first, the town has to send out the property cards to all homeowners. And an explanation of what all the abbreviation and abbreviations and codes are. More time is needed for homeowners to find and correct inaccuracies. KRT's model and results must be audited by an outside company to ensure that the proposed assessments are accurate. The initial analysis done by KRT, which set up the base indexes, must be reviewed and tested against the sales data. Property cards should be randomly audited as well. And finally, 
the tax bills should be prepared using the previous assessed value until we are confident that the new assessments are correct. Thanks. Hi, my name is Michael Sawyer. I live on Ford Track View Terrace, and I'm on Social Security, so I don't get much money. It takes about $1,100 to run my house every month. And that's not putting money away for emergencies. I get $1,450. That doesn't leave much for food or other stuff. Luckily, I have my system moved in downstairs, and that helps out. So, but still, there's not much money left over at the end of the month between the both of us. She has she's raising her granddaughter, and I live upstairs on the garage. The apartment up there is not done. It doesn't have a stove, it doesn't have a floor, it has a wood, uh, plywood floor. And he, the inspector never went up there because I had my dogs out and there was too much pain in the rear to put my dogs in, but I tried to tell him that. Uh, I just can't understand why my house went up $80,000. If you went and looked at it, you think the value would go down because the floors in it, the contract is never fixed. They altered the cabinets to fit the floor. They cut the cabinets so it, so it would be level with the floor instead of fixing the floor. The, the main beams in my, over the garage, I've been told by five carpenters, does not meet codes. It doesn't meet cold anywhere in the state of Maine, and especially in Scarborough. I have to have that inspected by an engineer because of code enforcement, not now, at the time, because the same people are not here that did it. So I don't want to blame the people here because they could be good people. But I've been lied to by the code enforcement two or three times. The house that I used to own, I asked the contractor to put the water so it doesn't drain on my property. And the code enforcement lied to me, saying that he, he doesn't have to do it. Well, it's draining on my property. Do you want me to drain on your property to make it a wetland? I don't think so. You know? So why should I pay taxes at all? You get a dog catcher that doesn't do anything. You call a hundred times, and my neighbor has one ticket over a hundred times being called. Cops won't do their job when they call for the dog. They'd rather lie to you because they know the person. They don't want to give a ticket. You know? So why am I paying taxes at all? If I don't get no services, I live on a private road. So I get no mail, no trash, I have to go down for it. My taxes should go down, not up. Thank you. Hi, I'm Scott Flaherty, 21 Vesper Street, Higgins Beach. I, uh, you, the town manager's probably right, they haven't done a citywide town for 14 years, but Higgins Beach has been reevaluated twice in the last 14 years. Story about my house, two and a half years ago, I built this house, brand new. The tax assessor came and assessed it. I had a construction loan. I had to, you know, and I, on closing, I had to have it evaluated myself, an appraisal. They were within $10,000, so I didn't, you know. So you tell, what they're doing, in two and a half years, they're up in my value $400,000. They made a $400,000 mistake two and a half years ago. I don't believe it. I just, I think that they're looking at, you know, some of the houses out there, yes, have sold for over a million dollars. That sits right on the water or whatever. That's one thing. I'm on a lot that the DEP controls, that I can only build 20% on that lot. I can't have a garage. I can't have a, you know, a carriage house like they can the street over. You know, they can build 35% out there. On Vesper Street, on my side of the street, I can only cover 20% of that lot. That's all I could build for a house lot on that lot, 20%.
But they're taxing us as it's, you know, just like the rest of the Higgins Beach, the value of the, my lot on Vesper Street is the same two streets over that can cover 35%, which that's another reason is it right. I mean, you tried to explain that to KIT, you know, whoever, the, you know, I went to that meeting. You know, I, you know, and I asked them, I said, how did I go from seven, under 700,000 to almost a million one? You know, you made a $400,000 mistake. I mean, maybe that appraiser or whatever should get fired then because she certainly made a big mistake. Uh, and, you know, so, and I think that everyone out there, you look at, they've increased all these houses, you know, not $8,000, $80,000, $200,000. Even Mr. Donovan over there sitting there, he's got an increase of over 300000 I mean, how can you how can you say that that how I mean I think I'm not sure but I'm pretty sure I think the last evaluation out there was like 2011 I mean Mr. Donovan probably knows when they did Higgins Beach they didn't do the whole town but they did Higgins Beach and they did Pine Point because they they seen it as a cash cow you know that's that's basically what they're looking for just because we live out there we're not rich I mean, it's what stuff we work for all our life. Thank you. Good evening, Rob Barbaro, 14 Beach Ridge Road here in Scarborough, also business owner of Complete Mobile. Um, I just want to share with the town some of my experience I had with this evaluation, um, and one concern in particular that did come up. Um, my home, when it was first evaluated all those years back, was at 220. Um, a couple of years back, we had to open a home equity line of credit cover some of the costs associated having a newborn, et cetera. The appraisal came back at 300,000 two years ago. The appraisal that was just done came back at 398,000 with no significant changes in between. I did have a meeting with the KRT. Um, the gentleman I met with, Kevin, was very helpful. I do give him credit for that. But the one thing that came up was I asked him, um, aren't your appraisers supposed to try to get into the homes? And he said, yes. I'm like, your appraiser never made an attempt to come to my home. I have internet doorbells, cameras, I know when someone comes to my house. He replied with, we had to let that guy go. But he wouldn't tell me why. He wouldn't explain, fine, that's their business. But if he wouldn't make an attempt to come to my home, there were errors that we did correct that he guessed on, on this estimate. As a business owner, when someone gets fired, they get fired for not doing their job. So how many more houses was this individual appraiser guessing at? So that's one thing that should be looked at. Was it 10? Was it 100? Was it 1,000? Someone wasn't doing something, and they got fired for it. Thank you. I'm going to switch gears to another agenda item that might be a little bit happier. Good evening. Sean Flaherty, Mr. Chairman, 218 Black Point Road. My remarks are going to be directed towards uh, the conservation land bond authorization. I've been a member of the Parks and Conservation Land Board for the past six or so years, and otherwise served on various committees and uh, commissions in elected office here in our town. I want to add my voice regarding the land bond as an individual taxpayer and not necessarily as a member of the committee. I agree with the recommendations, yet my remarks are not necessarily the opinions of the entire committee and they shouldn't be interpreted as such. I support the recommendation but want to highlight why I believe all taxpayers should support this proposal. Although I'm still under 35 years old, I've seen this community go through incredible changes and growth, some of it positive, some of it not. I only note my age because when the first conservation bond was passed, I was just a freshman at Scarborough High School two decades ago. And when this country was in the midst of the Great Recession, the voters of Scarborough once again authorized bonds for conservation and historic preservation. Needless to say, this town is now three times, in good times and bad, voted to support conservation in this town. These bonds, as a result, have concerned land across and in all corners of this community. From Pleasant Hill, through Warren Woods, out to Fuller Farm, including the Beach Ridge Historic Schoolhouse, and most recently, the beautiful Pine Point Preserve. These bonds have leveraged millions of more dollars in outside investments, matching funds, additional dollars from state and federal sources, grants from public and private entities, and donations from corporations, businesses, and taxpayers alike. 
This resulted in our town conserving more than a thousand acres, giving access to residents and visitors alike at a value to taxpayers. Value to taxpayers will be my final point. The Long Range Planning Committee 20 years ago undertook a study to try to calculate the cost benefit of development versus conservation. In that study, it was clear that conservation significantly saves taxpayer dollars when it's examined against residential development costs. Although the numbers have changed in 20 years, I think it's fair to say that the cost of residential development in our town has only increased since 2000, figuring 1.5 school children per each developed lot combined with the other increased cost in town services, I think it's clear, even using the conservative 2000 figures, that bond money spent conserving property is more cost effective for the town than allowing those lots to be developed into residential units. In short, conserving land actually saves taxpayer money, period. Three times our community has said yes to conservation, approving five million over 20 years. Those funds have been preciously reserved, wisely appropriated, and have delivered value-added benefits for taxpayers which are both tangible and intangible. We have to kick off the next 20 years with these proven methods, continue to set aside open space for future generations, conserve the history and the character of this town, and deliver valuable benefits for all taxpayers. I strongly urge your approval of this bond question and allow, uh, ask that you allow the taxpayers another opportunity to support conservation. Thank you very much. Betsy Gleistein, 14 Long Meadow Road. And um, I, I just would like to ask that you um, take into consideration that um, the process that we just underwent is uh, a lot of people don't have confidence in it, and I think that really does stand for something. Um, if uh, Ms. Hamill mentioned the City of Bath assessment, and if you look at the data released for the City of Bath assessment, um, first of all, it started, it was a seventh or eight month process. I'm not sure how we did ours in two months, did we pay a lot more, you know, um, how did we, the scenic values, all of these things, there's a lot of questions go to the city of Bath, they answered all these questions for their taxpayers. They also released extensive neighborhood data. We haven't seen any of that. They also released a lot of data in Excel format. We have a lot of number crunchers in town. This town has PhD, I personally know a guy who's PhD who could crunch a lot of this stuff. Um, and uh, I happen to be a data analyst myself. Um, so people need to get confidence in this data. I think you know, when you hear somebody's valuation in two years that went up 80 something percent, there's just, there's, there's questions there about what happened. We need to not rush to certify this and let's, even if we made some mistakes, let's go back and get confidence in how this was done and um, let's superimpose a lot of the data over the neighborhoods. Let's look at what some of the other towns have done and see if we can have some of that put out um, in a better format for our residents. And you know, the reevaluation is, it, it's, it's very stressful for everyone, um, especially if your property value went up and you feel like you're not gonna be able to pay. But one of the things it does is it pits neighbor against neighbors. And you know, it, this is what we don't wanna do. I'm sitting there comparing my value to my other neighbors and going, well, wait a minute, I don't have nearly this house. What, you know, what is going on with that? But if I had confidence in the process, I, I wouldn't be at, at that point. And I think tonight, we don't have confidence. I hope that's what you've been hearing from people. How do we get there? I think there's, I think John, you have come up with a lot of metrics that, that we could take a look at. Um, I think we could look at some other models like the city of Bath, and I think we can get there in pretty short order. I think it's great that the assessor has offered. I did call yesterday, uh, or day before, I didn't get a call back. Um, they weren't taking, they didn't answer the phone. I did go to the KRT meeting myself, but I really feel like don't rush to do this. Let's, let's, let's get a little more confidence in this process. I don't think KRT left people with a really great impression of how this was done. We're a great town. Let's do it right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bruce Turner. I uh, live on 44 Seabees Landing Road. And uh, I was reassessed in 2011 uh, when they did about a fine point, there was 
six houses they did, they went up 25% on all of them except me. They went up 50 on me, and then uh, Paul gave me a rebate of, put it back to 25%. Now my problem is I went to the mailbox the other day, and I've had everything but a stroke, and I thought I was going to have one. It went from 255 to 506,000, and I have changed nothing on my house since 86. I'm the only house on Seabees Landing Road that went up 98%. Ocean View didn't go up 98%, so there's a flaw there somewhere. And I guess the thing is how to get to the bottom of it. And I guess it's going to be through meeting with the assessor or whatever. But thank you. Paula O'Brien, Pondry Drive. Um, one thing Mr. Turner neglected to tell everybody is the land that he owns is 0.2 acres. Um, we trusted the town to do a fair and accurate revaluation and hire a company to do so, but a majority of homeowners have zero confidence that this was done. Um, detailed property cards should have been mailed with the letter that provided the last assessment versus the new assessment um, but that was not done. It is done by a couple of other assessment companies that I looked up on the internet. Um, the towns admitted to errors at Higgins Beach and Hillcrest, but haven't said what the errors at Higgins Beach were or why they feel these errors don't exist in other neighborhoods. Um, one fellow I know that lives at Pinecrest, he has a mobile home and it went from approximately $14,000 up over forty-two. Now in my eight years, few years of real estate, mobile homes don't appreciate. They depreciate. So I don't understand how that happens. Um, there's many, many errors, and that's evident on our Concerned Taxpayers of Scarborough Facebook page. Um, everything from I have a three-bedroom, not a four-bedroom. Um, there's uh, one particular homeowner that I spoke to who let them in their house, and I advised anyone to let them in, because if you have discrepancies, you're not gonna have anything to fall back on if you don't let them in. She let them in her house. They counted her breezeway as two-story, and it's one, she has a cathedral ceiling. Um, there was another that was counted as a two-unit, and it's a one-unit. Um, on mine, living space was counted where there's no heat. And I, I, at my review, I informed the reviewer who was, she was very, very nice, that I am one residential street in a commercial zone. She was completely unaware of that. I'm, I'm not even sure if there'll be an adjustment for that. Um, and they had my kitchen down as a modern kitchen. Well, I've repainted my cabinets, my 35-year-old cabinets, had me down as granite countertop. It's, it's laminate that looks like granite. But, you know, there was numerous, numerous errors, and I, I just think that you know they, they need to be fixed and I, I encourage the town to please send out property cards to all the homeowners now you said 8800 homeowners times 50 cents a stamp that's for just over that's almost forty five hundred dollars that's a drop in the bucket to what this this budget is in this town and it's it's probably the cost of an increase of one homeowner so to me, I think not everyone has computer access and not everyone's going to know. Some people are even homebound. They can't even get out of their homes. I mean, I can, I can think of one woman who has multiple sclerosis. She isn't going anywhere, you know. So I, I really, really encourage to mail the property cards as should have been done in the first place to each and every homeowner so they have a fair chance to review their information. Thank you. Hi, my, my name is Bonnie Campbell. I live at 40 Seabees Landing Road, um, and I'm sick, and I came to this, and I didn't come prepared because I didn't know this was happening tonight. But I live on the same uh, street as Bruce, and our taxes have gone up. Uh, and the last time that we got reassessed, uh, I came and talked to the assessor, and he, I asked him what the criteria that they used to assess our house 
And he said, that's what I think it should be at. And I go, well, I, I think you're probably a very smart man, but what other criteria did you use? And he had, he had nothing to give me. Um, and my husband was out to sea, so I was taking care of this. And um, I said, well, I would really like to, because it, it jumped up like, I can't, you know, I'm not feeling that great tonight. I really wish I had more information with me and I was more prepared. But, you know, it was around 500,000 then, and it had gone up. So um, I said, well, can I talk to somebody else? And he said, well, I'm the head of that committee and I will say no to you. And I said, okay, thank you. And I left. I'm not going to fight about this. But we just got our tax assessment. I have no idea what criteria they used. There was no property card in there. And it went up from 500 and changed to almost $700,000. And I, I almost dropped on the floor. And it, you know, like I don't, you know, like this is a big deal for us. We're gonna sell our house. I'm not staying in this town. You guys do not handle things people friendly here. Although I do have to say that the people that work to register the cars and the dogs and stuff, they're wicked nuts. <laughs> but you guys, really, think about what's happening to the people in this town. You know, a few years ago, there was uh, a thing, uh, a referendum put out that we would keep the taxes the same until you sold. And there was money that came in from out of state and a lot of scare tactics of that. And now people like Bruce is going to be taxed out of his house. And he's lived here his whole life. That is disgusting. And I don't want to live in a town that treats their people like that. Anybody else want to come up to the podium this evening? Seeing no one, I'll go. Yes, <coughs> Steve McBrady, Windmore Drive, Scarborough. I had quite a bit of distrust in KRT coming from the commercial section last year, where the property taxes doubled, and you had two weeks to pay. And if you have a tenant, and their property taxes were up $46,000, it's very hard to say, hope you didn't budget for it, but here it is. So when this came around this time, <coughs> I looked at it. I looked at 8,573 properties in the town. Of the 8,573 properties, 127 stayed the same, meaning within $5,000 in value. But most of those were empty wood lots. There were 28 houses that stayed the same. There were 267 houses that went down in value. And what bothered me with the 267 is 124 of those houses are in Prout's Neck. I don't want to get into this comparing neighbors and neighbors, but 124 houses went down a total value of $34,487,600. That's almost $300,000 a house on average. Now, other people shouldn't be paying for the Proud Snack people. It's just, it seems weird that over half of the houses that went down in value are in Proud Snack, and I think something's definitely wrong. Thank you. Anybody else want to come forward this evening? Seeing none, we'll close out public comment. Thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda are the minutes from July 17th and July 30th. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? Any changes, edits? All in favor? That's unanimous, thank you. Actually, um, I abstained because I wasn't at either of those meetings.
Um, item number six is adjustments to the agenda. I don't believe there are any adjustments this evening. Item number seven are items to be signed, which I have done and returned. Um, then turning to sort of um, our, our agenda items, order uh, number. Actually, Mr. Chairman, yes. can we adjust the agenda to have uh, the, would it be possible to adjust the agenda to actually do order number 19061 first so we can at least perhaps acknowledge some things that we heard and, and just use the, that order as a way of, we just heard some considerable public comment and I don't think I feel 100% comfortable just going on to okay. stamping uh, food service permits right now. So I just feel like if we talk about that order, we can at least t take yeah. some time to address what we just heard. So do you need a motion to change the agenda? Any discussion? All in favor of changing the order? So I guess we're on to, we're going to change the order, and we're going to actually talk about order number 19061. Um, it's a first reading uh, and waive the second reading on the proposed recommendation to change the current interest rate of 9% per annum on unpaid taxes as approved in order number 19029 by the Town Council on May 15, 2019, as follows. Zero interest on unpaid taxes after Tuesday, October 15, 2019, and five percent per annum on unpaid taxes after Monday, March 16, 2020. And, and Tom, do you want to give some introduction into at least the conversation around that, and then we can open it up? Yeah, sure. The conversation started at the Finance Committee uh, meeting last week, I believe. Uh, I was asked to provide a, a, a number of different options, uh, this being one of them. And the committees, uh, I think, unanimously uh, uh, thought it was wise to bring this uh, before the full council. This is in direct recognition of what one of the speakers just uh, mentioned. Uh, there are, certainly are cases where taxpayers will be responsible for a tax bill that they did not expect and plan for. And so I think this is a very appropriate uh, recognition of that uh, potential. Uh, to allow folks to um, put together the resources to, to meet that obligation. So this would uh, have no interest accrue uh, for taxes that are unpaid after the first due date, uh, but then and then drop the uh, interest that's charged from 9% to 5% on the second half of the unit. Um, I would note, uh, just from an administrative point of view, uh, there are, there's a budgetary impact, but we certainly have time to adjust, and it's certainly not enough to, to make an issue. I think it's an appropriate gesture, and I highly recommend, recommend it. So with that, is there any public comment? I'm Sue Hamill, uh, Bay Street. I think it's a great gesture, but I can tell you, it's going to, I'm not paying my taxes until March. If someone's giving me an offer like this, where I'm getting basically an interest-free loan for six months, I'm taking it. So you better be prepared that there's going to be a lot of people like me who are going to choose not to pay. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone else? Any other public comment? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? I mean, no. discussion. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> discussion. Uh, sorry, got ahead of myself. <laughs> discussion, Paul. I, I actually, uh, I had a similar question to Ms. Hamill. It, it, is there any deterrent to prevent people from just not paying for six months? There's not. As, as, as uh, the motion is formed, it does not discern among taxpayers. It, it would afford the same uh, requirements across the entire tax base. Okay. I, I would personally probably be more comfortable with market, like 3%, 3.5%, to create a deterrent. Um, just my initial thoughts. Um, I had the same concerns as Council Cloutier, and I know I talked to uh, Mr. Manager, and, and Mr. Hall told, you know, we discussed that the budgetary impact wouldn't be that much. 
However, I had considered that you put the uh, stipulation on it that it's zero percent interest for people who are seeking an abatement, um, and anyone else, it's a reduce. We could reduce it down to something else, but I'm concerned that there'll be people who will just say, "Oh, great, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to pay my taxes." And I understand that a lot of people like myself, it's escrowed, it's paid, my mortgage company pays it, but I still know there's enough people in town who walk in and with their checks in hand. Um, and so I, I don't want, I hate to say if someone would abuse it, but that's where I'm coming from with that. Councilor Johnson? I, I agree with both counselors, but I don't, I don't foresee it being enough I, I believe at the finance committee meeting we said it's somewhere in the ballpark of a hundred thousand dollars. Was that in the last, for the last three years combined or each year? I think it's it's about half of that. Uh, that, right. that combines with prior year. Uh, right. So I guess I'm at the at, at the stage that we are as a town and with with the fact that many people are going to be going into the abatement process. I think I'm willing to risk that fifty grand of I mean of people that are taking advantage of it, so to speak. Clearly, there'll be people that pay, that pay, what, uh, that take advantage of it and that don't need to take advantage of it. But for the purposes of simplicity and to, to follow through on something that would benefit everybody that is trying to go through the process and have them look at their tax bill, I, I'd keep it the way it is. If I could, aside from the budgetary impact, the other impact, and it probably falls deaf on most is uh, a cash flow issue yeah, for the right. town. That's we right. have obligations uh, <laughs> consistently. Uh, we do expect, uh, because a, a fair number of our uh, taxes are paid through a third party, through a, a escrow, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we expect that those will continue on a, a regular pace. So we think we've done the analysis, we think we can live through uh, and we'll have sufficient resources to meet our needs. I think I agree oh. with Councillor uh, uh, Paul. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's the simplicity of it that I like. Uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, tax payment made because the funds are escrowed. Uh, so they're going to come in regardless of whether the taxpayer might want, want to take advantage of it. Uh, a lot of people have the money available and they're not, gaining, they're not having any return on investment because it's in a checking account. And so they they're not going to gain any advantage by uh, delaying the payment uh, because they're not gaining any interest on that money. Council Hamill. Um, I applaud the spirit in which uh, this um, made its way to the agenda. Uh, I think it's wholly inadequate uh, and I'm not going to vote in favor of it for that reason primarily, but also the reason that uh, I, I think it does, we do run the risk of incentivizing the wrong behaviors. And based upon my experience with this whole process, uh, this is a much bigger task for us. So suggesting that somehow this is our you know, first official move and that's gonna be uh, enough to, uh, to make people feel better. I, I, I am, think we are sadly mistaken. Uh, there were other things that we discussed that I think require much more thought and discussion. So, um, and I appreciate the desire to move quickly and to respond quickly, decisively. This is wholly inadequate and absolutely the wrong way for us to uh, try to fix a much larger problem. Yeah, a question to the manager through the chair. Um, at, when people don't pay taxes, we lien their property. How long does it take to put a lien on if someone does not pay their taxes? I believe it's 18 months, so it takes okay. some time for right. taxes unpaid for that to occur. Okay. Johnson? Yeah, I just to follow up on what Don said, I, I'm under no illusions that this is some sort of gesture that's going to make these hardships go away. So let me make that very clear. However, it's within our purview. It's something that we can do. I, I, I know that there's lots of advocacy out there for holding the tax rate the way it is. I know that's not what we're talking about right now, but I'm going to address it. If we hold the tax rate where it currently is, that means we're overcharging the mill rate for every other property in town and every single, actually every single commercial property owner in this town would be overcharged their taxes. So if you own a commercial building, you'd be paying too much taxes and you, there would be a very viable lawsuit against us 
because of that. So I just wanted to address it. I know it's not the agenda, so I'm breaking the rules a little bit, but I do, I do want to explain why that's not necessarily getting kicked around up here is because it's, it would literally be over at the, it would be literally overcharging 70% of the town. So mm -hmm. this is inadequate. Don't get me wrong. It's inadequate. It's, it's no comfort for anybody in this audience, fully aware of that, but it's something we can do and it's small, but it's within our purview. Yeah, I, I guess for me, um, it's been a really interesting process to observe because as a real estate agent, <laughs> um, I know what homes are selling for and you know the market we've been in has been uh, really overheated um, and that's a challenge. Um, it's a challenge it, it, it's posed a challenge to our whole town now. Um, I also uh, heard everybody loud and clear at the podium tonight and in the, I don't know, hundreds of emails that we've had over the last two weeks. Um, and I, and I expressed this the first time we talked about it, I don't think it's isolated to just Hillcrest and Higgins Beach. I'm concerned with greater and broader um, issues. Um, and that's a continuing growing concern. So I agree with um, both Councillor Johnson and Hamill that this is completely inadequate. I do feel like it's something, it's a step, but I don't think it's the only thing that we can be doing. And I think um, we're gonna have uh, even more on our hands, but um, I'm gonna support it because I would rather do something than nothing, but not because I think it's the answer or, or the remedy for all. I, I think there, this, this process has been flawed from both a uh, functional perspective, but also the communication. Um, we really dropped the ball, and I'm going to own that because I think we could have done better, uh, and I think our town deserves better. I just have a quick question for the town manager, Tom. Um, so I hear you, what percentage of our tax intake is from third parties, escrows and stuff? Is it a 50, 60 percent? No, I think it's probably it? closer to 35 or 40 percent. <laughs> And if we were to run, if, if the scenario plays out and we run short of cash, what are our viable options? In the past, we've talked about this, and some of them weren't all that pleasant. But well, it would be a tax anticip anticipation note. Essentially, you borrow against uh, the expectation of future receipts. Is there really unfavorable interest rates, or is it about market rates, or? Uh, the, the, well, I have actually. We this never town has done. never had yeah. to do it, so it's been ten plus years since I've even looked at those rates. Yeah. But uh, just the thought of paying interest on, on that is um, not terrific for sure. Yeah. So I, uh, uh, but it's a vehicle that's, that's available. For that would be last resort, but uh, <laughs> if we ever ran into a cash flow problem, we would have, uh, we have obligations we need to meet, so that would be our, the alternative. Uh, so with Council Don? No, go right ahead. No, no, go ahead. Uh, I, I, I think there were errors with KRT, and I completely agree that I'd like to do more. But I would like to say that I've been so impressed with David Buffard's uh, take on this. He gets a problem presented, and he's acted upon it. Uh, all of Hillcrest Terrace, and this is a land valuation problem, not a house valuation mm -hmm. problem. Yes, people had two bedrooms when they were listed as three, but the, uh, the amounts that we're talking about that really impact people are that their land value is doubling. Uh, and they go, where did that come from? Well, in the case of Hillcrest Terrace, uh, it was looked at long and hard immediately by our assessor, and he corrected it. And I was very proud. I had not had much contact with him before, but he seemed to be a person who really sympathized with individuals and responded to it. Council yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to echo that, um, I, I, and we saw it uh, happen today, where we, if you have uh, an outstanding issue with your bill, you should contact the assessing department. And I know they've been too busy the past couple of days to respond because they're trying to, to work towards commitment, but I can guarantee you they'll work with you and they'll, they'll listen and, um, and make any changes that they you know, feel are appropriate. Um, I also agree that, that you know, going to zero percent, or this is... A, a token um, and not enough for people whose taxes might be going up you know 50 percent plus uh, I'm still concerned with uh, a zero percent interest rate for uh, the October tax payment because I feel like you could have a thousand 
um, residents or businesses decide not to pay. And I think that could put you in a cash flow issue. Um, so I, I don't think I would support the 0%. Um, I, the other item that I wanted to mention is th th this has been a stressful uh, time for a lot of residents, but also for a lot of staff. And I've personally seen a lot of staff stay over time, come in when they were um, supposed to be on vacation to try to help the community through this period. And I, I think that should be recognized in that while, the, yes, we can certainly improve on our communications and our processes, and we should, um, uh, there's a lot of staff getting caught in the middle, and uh, they should be thanked for the work that they do. There's an expression that's used in the medical community. It's called the Hippocratic Oath, and it goes something like this, first do no harm. And I feel very strongly about that. Uh, I've been really distressed about this whole thing, and uh, I think every, everyone I've talked to on the council said they have never seen an issue quite like this in terms of the... Uh, the response, how strongly people feel about it, how it goes to the very core of issues that we've had that have been the basis for much division in the community. So I, I think our work not only is not over, it hasn't begun yet in terms of a council, in terms of our review of this. You know, I, I have, I think there have been a number of options that, that have been offered, uh, and you've heard some of them here. Uh, I think we need to huddle as a council and come back with something much more meaningful. We've talked about the process uh, that Dave Buffard has offered, and I think the guy is doing a heroic job, but heroism alone will not solve this. And it's unfair to put our staff in that sort of position to fix things that, for which there are clearly questions about systemic issues. So I, I think this would create harm. And for that reason, I'm not, I, since I said before, I'm not voting for it, but we as a group need to take the time to go deep on this and come back with a response that's meaningful and respectful of people who have been injured by this, who have been hurt deeply by it, not just by the facts of it, but by how we have communicated and not communicated about it, and how we are yet unwilling to, to go back and really look hard at the process, and there's actually nothing that prevents us from doing that. We have an obligation an affirmative ob obligation to do that as a council, to fulfill our role as you know, stewards of the community and trying to do what's best in the interest of, of our residents. So uh, I'm you know, sorry about the speech, but I feel very strongly about this. We need more time and we need to come back next week as something that's a lot more meaningful than this. Um, I, I'm gonna take a different tack. Um, yes, when you do revals the way they've been done, these are what they call mass appraisal, so to speak. You're not taking houses individually to look at them, you're looking at trends and it's a statistical analysis as much as anything. And yeah, there are gonna be some mistakes made. Uh, I don't think there's any deep, dark, horrible, dreadful thing that's occurred other than we waited too long. I wanna remind people that we put this out to vote in 2014, as I recall, and people said no. We don't want to pay for a reval now. Well, if we had had a reval back then, it wouldn't have been as painful as it is now because as a real estate broker myself, I can tell you right now that I went through the whole reval list and most properties were really not that far out of whack from a purely statistical viewpoint as far as what values probably are in general areas of town. My own valuation went up more than 50%. But I was undervalued for a long time, to be honest with you. Uh, and now I'm gonna have to pay catch up. And that's, you know, and that's the way it goes sometimes. So that being said, I really don't like to hear, you know, you're demonizing the process, demonizing KRT. There's a process in place. Um, you have to remember that as a council, we're very limited in what we can do. It's a state process. The assessor, even though they have their office downstairs, technically they work for the state. I don't know if you knew that. And they have very specific rules and process that they are expected to follow, which, which he's been doing. And he will continue to do, David will continue to do. Um, I, again, I've, I've told people, I encourage people to call the assessor. You need to sit down with the assessor 
And if there are major issues with a difference in what you see in your valuation or you've got questions about it or anything, they're happy to talk to you. We do need to set a, a, a mill rate by law by September 1st, I believe it is. And that's state law again. Um, and we need to move forward. That being said, I see this um, being willing to, you know, if people are still not sure about their taxes, don't, can't write the check right now, whatever, I see, okay, we can give them a, a, a special interest rate at this point, maybe not zero. I can understand Mr. Cloutier's point on that also. And Mr. Donovan was showing me that the, um, whatever you call it, the anticipation bonds yeah. are what, about 1.5%? That's the rate on those. Maybe that's what we charge. But, um, you know, we're willing to do something. But, folks, we're 14, we are, well, how many years out are we? 14. 14 years. We haven't been revalued as a town, so it's it's going to be painful. And I, I know I and I don't want to sound like a wise guy, but if I show if you called me and said I want to sell my house today, and I went to you and I said, look, you know, I'm going to list it, and my list price is less than what you're assessed at. Do you know what people say to me? Well, that's not enough. That's what the town has me assessed. The town's got me assessed at 500, and you're telling me I can only sell it for 450. So, give it some thought, okay? That's it. So I guess bringing it full circle back to the motion on the table, does anybody have a motion they'd like to introduce to amend what we have? We've had some conversation about different interest rates, but this is a first and second read for this item, so. Um, right. We're we're asking you to waive the second reading, and, and we're doing that so we can make sure that uh, but, it but will, the, will apply. Right. So, so this is a once and done tonight. Once and done. So yeah. it's either this or something different. So I would uh, move to amend it. Sorry, my first uh, I think motion. Uh, I I would amend the zero percent to one and a half percent. And I would second that. All those in favor of introducing a discussion that? on the motion. Discussion. We, discussion. We're just voting to vote on amending. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. So a discussion on. Well, I mean, the, the logic of that is that it's going to discourage people who don't have any reason to delay the payment. They have the money, but it will give, and we've already agreed that it's. It's not as much as we would like to do anyways. So it's, it's a very low impact on people who have increased their taxes by a great deal. So, I mean, there's some logic to the, mo to the motion for that. Any other? Uh, well, I would just say, I mean, I, I already said I was going to support it as it was, and I appreciate the conversation uh, and debate. And... Um, would, you know, I see this as a, a trying to meet somewhere uh, in the middle um, and still do something. I'm, this is the wrong time to ask. I, I actually wanted to go back to the original and, and, and ask Councilor Hamill to ex explain a little further because I wasn't quite understanding where he was coming from and that this would do more harm. Um, so I don't know if that's appropriate for me to Why? ask that now or not, but um, I'm, I will, I support the amendment. I'd be happy to respond to my fellow Councilor. Um, you could do harm by incentivizing bad behavior, uh, and, and um, uh, I know we considered other things like sending out the, you know, the tax bills on the old assessment. I'm not, I'm not there yet. That's going to require so much time and discussion. That's worthy of our focusing on and coming back again to talk about, perhaps next week. You know, definitely next week. So I'm just, so that's, you know, I know we're well intentioned, but this is. The wrong move. It's our first official move. We're we're missing the boat, and and we're and I appreciate Councillor Cloutier's um, motion to try to whittle it down. But the logic in my mind for the thing is is flawed, and I think this as a solution is a uh, I, I I can't vote for it. So I 
Um, I think we, we can do better, we must do better. The community deserves more than this and this is, uh, it's embarrassing by its inadequacy. So returning to the motion to amend the zero interest rate to 1.5%, are there any other comments at this point? Discussion? Mm -hmm. All those in favor of the motion to amend? So that passes. So now we're back to the main motion as amended. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. um, is there any further discussion of the main motion as amended? Councilor Johnson? I'm just not going to support it because I think it should be zero. <laughs> okay. So any other discussion of Councilor Donald? Yeah. Councilor Hamill was saying that it, this is inadequate. Now, many of us said we think it's inadequate. And I guess what what I would like to see us continue to pursue is what other steps there are. I agree. So I don't think we ought to stop here. I'm not sure what's left that we as counselors, as opposed to the assessor, because the assessor can make it right in every case. And, and maybe the outreach effort that we talked about earlier to get make sure people had the opportunity to understand if there's a mistake. But the overwhelming majority of these are accurate. Mm -hmm. That's what you have to understand. Overwhelming majority of these are accurate. Doesn't mean, though, that we shouldn't try and get to as close to 100% as possible. Councilor Hamill. Uh, I would just like to say, I'm not sure how we can draw that conclusion if we haven't even had a report from the assessor and KRT, which is a normal, normal course and actually permitted by our our uh, consulting services agreement with KRT. We haven't even done that yet. We haven't even done that analysis, so how we can claim that the vast majority have been done correctly, I think is, is simply uh, an impossible statement to make with, with any certainty. And I, this is a much larger issue. You have a lot of people who, in town who study this very closely. We're in the unfortunate position where now we're relying on people who um, are circulating information because there's a lack of information from the town. And uh, we're blank and they're out there. Uh, people are now seeking out advocacy groups because they're, they're a more trusted source of information. I, I, I think we need to take the time to, to go back after this and to look at it and to confirm what work was done and how it was done and then to fix, fix it if we can and to allow time to do that. And I think there's a way for us to do it, but trying to, to, trying to solve it now in the back end of a motion that is getting whittled down, I think, is not the right way to do it. So uh, I guess I'll, you know, just kind of echo, I, I think that's what everybody said. I, I think we've all said, I think there's some real learnings from this. I think we need to do sort of that evaluation. I think we will know more as the weeks go on, as some of these things are talked about. Council, Council Hamm, I know you had suggested next week might be a place to come back, but let's, if we can get to just the motion that's on the table at this point, um, which I think as amended changes the zero interest rate to 1.5%. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Is there any more comments about that, discussion about that? So all those in favor of that as amended? So it's 5-2. It's so thank you. Do you want to take the negative vote? Yeah. Do oh. Yeah. He said, <laughs> he said five, five two. Oh, yes. No, yes. He no, said five two. I trust your math. Stretch. I trust your math. I know we've been questioning. <laughs> you, you I'm, you got I'm with you, Mr. Yeah. Hamill. <laughs> I wanted to raise my hand. <laughs> so now we'll return back to the original order of the agenda, which is now order number 19057. Um, which is a public hearing and action on the following new requests for a food and handler's license. One is Anna White, DBA yeah. Lake and Company, located at 4 Sill Rock Drive. Two is Jonathan Carr, Todd Greenquist, I guess, DBA Nothing, Nothing Bunk Cakes, located at 555 Gallery Boulevard, Suite D. And Daniel Mays, a Faith of Firth Farm, LLC, located at 61 Ash Swamp Road. So all applications that? are um, filed in the office. Check with other uh, departments. Everything is okay. Um, the uh, nothing but bunk 
kids who receive their um, free handler's license once they get their occupancy permit, and they're very nice. They're very yeah. delectable. Uh -huh. um, and I would recommend approval. <laughs> So is there any anybody in the audience that wants to speak to this? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I am reminded of a prior counselor, and probably people will know who we're talking of. You should demand in these circumstances samples to, <laughs> That's to, right. to better understand. <laughs> when you mentioned the great bun cakes, that, they that really were good. Yeah, and it's a, <laughs> and it's an awesome name. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's old business. I mean, old business. Then at this time, now new business. Um, Order number 19058, first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the order authorizing the issuance of up to 1.6 million in bonds of the town to fund the cost of replacing the existing artificial turf field and renovating the existing track surface and place the following question on the November 5th, 2019 municipal ballot. Shall the order entitled order authorizing insurance of up to 1.6 million in bonds of the town to fund the cost of artificial turf replacement and track referring, resurfacing at the Scarborough School be approved. Um, with that, Tom, you want to give I mean, a couple introductory remarks. This is, as I understand it, this was something that was in the budget that we had approved as going to referendum. Yes. The numbers are different, which we can talk about. Right. But this is a change in procedure where, by legal advice, it was in, it was suggested this should be an action, formal action by the council. Yeah, uh, the clerk and I were of the opinion, uh, and, and quickly corrected by legal counsel, uh, because it was part of the budget process, which goes through its own first, second reading, and public hearing. Uh, those steps would have been satisfied. So I think this is uh, an appropriate, uh, but probably a, a overly cautious step, just to make sure the proper pro process is followed. So. She has recommended that we uh, we move this through the normal approval process to make sure it gets the proper public airing. And, and I was just going to ask Tom for, for Tom. Can you just explain, although or I'm not sure, why the number that we're seeing now is different than what got authorized in the budget? Like yeah, or you or whatever. The clearly, program. our budget estimate was uh, was inadequate. Uh, we're working on uh, you know the best information information we had for budget purposes. Since then, we have gone through a formal RFP process and have actual bids. Very pleased to uh, report with uh, how robust the um, the bidding was. So we feel as though we've got a very good sense of what the market is. There are still some unknowns, frankly, uh, particularly the, the drainage and, and a lot of the work underneath that we don't exactly have all the detail on. And so there is still some uh, exploration and some variation in price. At this juncture, we're recommending the $1.6 million number because that's kind of the higher end of the bids. Um, I know that uh, the community services director and the athletic director have uh, met with, uh, kind of shortlisted it down to three vendors and have had initial meetings with each of them and we'll be refining, um, probably identifying a preferred vendor and really refining that price before your second reading. So to the extent that we have more confidence uh, in second reading, we'll deliver that information to you. But uh, at this point, uh, we recommend 1.6 million. Was it just a pure change in price or was it also a change in scope of what was gonna be done? Uh, Todd looks like he's itching to speak. Um, yeah, no, I, just, it was a it was, a, it was a change in scope and some variables that have changed that drove some of the, um, the pricings. And the big issue that Tom mentioned is some of the other stuff. Initially, when we had the, the uh, estimates as far as the track and turf, and it was track at 700 and the, and the um, excuse me, the turf at 700 and the track at the 350, um, we're finding that our base, as the companies get out, shared information, um, we have an old track that they laid over years and years ago in the early 90s. And that's why we're getting a lot of the cracking we are today. So the, the, the options that we're dealing through right now are um, digging that up completely and having a, a base that's going to last us another 30 years. And then your traditional track is a 12 to 15 year track with, with warranties. Um, or going with a mill and a shim, which is probably, you know, two thirds of the cost, but you might be back in the same boat. And so that's why we're weighing out those options right now with the vendors. And, like Tom mentioned, our goal would be to get a preferred vendor to then go back because the engineering piece would be the next step to decide what those bases are, where we are, what's the best value to us as a town. 
because it's a 52 percent increase from what was approved in the budget. Right. So it's the other year. issues that's come up mm -hmm. is um, uh, when the vendors are all out there, uh, some of the safety standards have changed. Our perimeter fence around the, the track is literally within 18 inches of the inside line. By standards, we're supposed to be a meter in the new standards and some of the long jump events where our, our structure and our um, pits are 19 feet, now they're 24 feet long. So we've got some structural changes that have been changed out uh, recently, but the safety concerns are the ones that we need to address in this process, and that goes along with shape of the track, milling versus fill, how do they use that um, to try to make it as safe as possible. Does anybody else have any questions for Todd while he's at the podium about this? That's good. I do, yeah. On the uh, memo that you sent, you, you have a breakdown of the, the quotes, and this is included yep. with the agenda packet, yep. but you have items one through four, yep. um, and it looks like some companies chose to quote different portions. Uh, I had two questions. One, are you able to do this a la carte with different vendors, or are you looking to do one for the whole thing? And then the second question was, what does list A refer to? Yep. So, yep, good questions. And so the way we put this out as a proposal, because we weren't we didn't know what we didn't know regarding basis. So companies came in and we set certain standards that we wanted to meet the safety standards. We wanted to make sure we addressed the cracking in the track. And so we asked them to come back with the proposal that they thought would best serve us long term and not what a lot of times happens, they bring in the lowest number to be able to fix, you know, the process as far as being on the lowest bidder. And so um, we laid those items out and they're, they're all different in the sense of um, how they install. Some are proposing drains, uh, slot drains to fix some of the drainage. We have cone drains on the end of the D zones, and so they all, th that's not the way you build tracks anymore. So those all need to be raised and shimmed. Um, and so that's where you see the disparity in some of the turf numbers. The track numbers um, range between somebody saying that we can put a surface on there, which is about $240,000. Some saying I can mill it down two inches, put an inch and a half back, and then surface it. <coughs> bases, and then some are saying the bigger numbers are complete pullout and then fixing the base underneath. And so that's what we're, Mike and I met, we, we narrowed it down to three vendors. We've had uh, proposal sessions with them trying to find out what out. Our goal would be able to pick a vendor to then be able to sit down and negotiate some of this, like, and then vet it um, to try to get a number back to the fourth. But the list A item is um, all the items that go into fence. Uh, field goals, anything that has to go on the ground prior to the surfacing, the, you know, long jump pits, uh, field goal, um, fencing around, um, safety netting on the end, all those things have to be renovated. And so there's, those are things that we can look at to evaluate price and cost. So. Anybody else? Any questions? I have a question. Uh, is, so have we made any uh, insurance claim on the damage that was done to the turf and how would that be? Would that offset this in any way, or how would we handle that from an accounting standpoint? It was about a twenty-five thousand dollar repair. Uh, it, it is. We learned that that turf is not covered under insurance policy because it's not a structure. Hmm. So we learned something in that process. However, there is a criminal prosecution that will be pursued and will be seeking restitution. So we are hopeful through that process we'll get reimbursed. But we have moved ahead and made emergency repair, so it's playable uh, right. for fall sports. Thank you. Actually, it's not for Todd, so I'll okay. wait. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we move to council, is, is there any public comment on on this on this order? Seeing none. Um, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Okay. Discussion. I just want to put out two things. I I, I intended to. Uh, the wording is is critical. It's up to a number, and so that's part of the reason that we're being uh, we're proposing the high number. At the same time, we're acutely aware that we do not want to overstate what we need to do the job. Uh, but we would be remiss in our duties not to uh, at least further explore this and come back to you with our, our, our best estimate to do the best by way of uh, the facilities. Tom, can you just, uh, I'm not sure I got it straight, but can you, what amount did we approve in the budget? For this? One million fifty thousand. One million fifty thousand. Okay. <coughs> uh, Tom, are we doing this specifically because the number is deviates so much from the budget process, or is this just a new precedent that we're going to start doing? Yeah, I think it's a practice that we'll adopt. Okay. Um, okay. Oftentimes, there's questions uh, when bonds are going to be sold. Uh, really smart lawyers scour over all the documents, make yep. sure all the approvals are in place. Okay. This is an area that it's just easy to clean up at the front end, so there's no questions okay. later on. Thank you. 
<laughs> you mess you I'll, 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 I'll keep the floor. Um, so I understand that this is bonding, but if you look back, I, four months ago, we had a two week, very elaborate process for $400,000 in trailers for Eight Corners School. Um, and again, I understand that this is just authorization to borrow up to $1.6 million, but it is a 50% deviation from what we talked about. It is a greater amount of money than the portables that spent, that took hours and hours of about 16 to 20 people's time to vet this publicly. So I actually don't know what I'm doing right now, but I, it, it doesn't sit incredibly well with me compared to what we just had to do three months ago. And I, I understand those were out of cycle. I understand that they were cash. I understand there were impact fees and this isn't quote the same thing, but that's why we have the process of the budget. So. Um, so I am in 100% agreement, um, really disappointed to see a number jump like that and change like that when we did devote a great deal of time uh, and energy to the conversation um, about, you know, that amount of money that would normally have to go to voters anyway. So I, um, I, I know it's needed. I know it's necessary. I'm not sure the 52% jump was necessary. Um, so I'm in the same boat. I honestly uh, don't think I can support this. I'm just confused. So if it came at 1.6, if you came okay. in the budget, then the numbers that we talked about and, and then approved in our budget, I would have supported it. Yes, but to okay. come up 52 percent from where we approved just feels disrespectful of the process. Well, Councilor Ketter. With all due respect, no. <laughs> um, just to remind people, this is to put it on the ballot, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah. those taxpayers get to make the choice whether they want to spend this or not. Mm -hmm. So I would support it to put it out on the ballot. So, Councilor Don, and it reflects the actual cost. It's not like uh, it, this is a guess now. This is this has been a firmed up number. Well, it's still somewhat of a guess, right? I mean, but yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't. That was out of turn. Apologies. You had me here at uh, you know uh, when when I thought this was the number that we had approved. I would have said this was necessary uh, if that was the number we had approved. I walked the track before we voted on this during the budget process, mm -hmm. and there was a need then. That's before someone took their pickup truck over it. Mm -hmm. But how about we look at money like it's our own money? When a number swings by a cool half million. That is a problem for me. I mean, it, I don't make decisions like this on a regular basis in my household, but, if, but that's crazy. And so I, I think we're being entirely irresponsible if we approve a number or we just say, oh, we should just get it on the ballot. And that, that is a sort of a, you know, it's a somewhat predictable recommendation, but we're not in that environment anymore. This is a tough time to look for money, to spend money. And if we're this cavalier about another, you know, five hundred and fifty, you know, four hundred fifty thousand dollars, five hundred fifty thousand dollars, I have a real problem with that. Councilor Fuld. So I want to take a little bit different approach on on my feeling and my view, and that part of the biggest challenge I've seen in the three years that I've been on the council is this idea of building trust with the public, and so for me, when I when we talked about it before and I approved a number. Um, that's the number I would have expected to see, and I would have had no problem going through that. But again, it, with the, that big of a jump, I think what it says to the public is that what we've put out before doesn't matter. And I think we have to say what we mean and mean what we say and stick to that, and it, at least a, a little bit closer. I mean, if it, you know, maybe if it was 1.2, I, I don't know. And I know numbers can get adjusted. But I think out of principle for me, I, I, that public perception, we're dealing with a ton of it right now, obviously with the tax, uh, with the revaluation piece. So um, I, that's, that's, I think it's important. If I could just interject, we, we, could, we have a bid that is nearly within our budget. Um, I think what staff is here telling you is that we don't believe that's adequate to meet the need. And if it's our fault for not, for having an inadequate budget estimate, we'll accept that responsibility. But we're here now with good information telling you what professionals in the field, not just one, but multiple, are telling us is the right thing to do. And, and I think the proposition is, is whether we let the voters decide whether that's a, a worthy use of tax resources. 
just quick. Yeah, uh, I'm kind of all over the place as, as well with this one. I, it, it is a huge increase, and I, I think Todd did a um, sufficient job of explaining that uh, going into the budget cycle, we had assumed that scraping the um, the, the track and, and just resurfacing would be sufficient. And now we have information that that might not be the best long-term option for us to pursue, and we don't have exact numbers on what, we'll have more exact numbers next week. So I, I guess talking through it, I, I would be in favor of moving this forward to second read um, with the expectation that we'll have more firm numbers um, next time, especially considering that it was something that was contemplated in the budget and will be going out to the voters. Um, and, it, and that'll just give us a little more time to, uh, to think it through whether that extra half million dollars is um, something that we're, we're willing to commit to right now or put in front of the voters right now. And I guess where I would be is kind of echoing what everybody said. To me, um, in the budget process, I think there's an expectation when numbers are put forth and we're deliberating and making tough trade-off decisions, those numbers should be well vetted and valid. Um, I'm not comfortable. There's, you know, approving 1.6 is we're kind of given a nod to, yeah, we're okay going after that. I would become more comfortable approving this motion tonight on the first read with the original numbers and saying they actually have some quotes that would come in around the original numbers. I'd rather have the first read be that number, have them sharpen the pencil so when we come back, but I absolutely agree with, and, and it, for the next three items, these three bond issues that are on the agenda we're talking about for a referendum, as we look ahead and the things that we're facing and trade-offs, even the discussion tonight about a community center. I mean, we have on the, these bond issues, we're going to have close to almost, what, four million, four and a half million in bonds for this fall, for the items that are on here. I just, you know, again, I think we need to really pick and choose the priorities of what we do. I. I so I, too, am disappointed that this did not come in at what we, when we approved it in the budget, that's the number we approved. So I'm not going to support it as written. I would support it being at, at, at the level that was in the budget for the first read. So I don't know if anybody wants to make a motion to do that, or we just vote on this motion as is. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to... No uh, second, uh, we're waiving second reading. No, this is no. This first no, reading, no. schedule of public hearing, and second reading. reading. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So it can be changed at the second reading. Correct. Yeah, I can't so, yeah. more information. But second reading is uh, a week from now. So, right. Right. So I, I would like to make a motion to amend. Councilor Foley, yeah. Need a second. Oh, you want to know what it is? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it's late. Um, yeah, so I would make a motion to amend to reflect the uh, number that we approved at the budget, which was one million fifty, as at least a starting point to get through the first reading, and then we'll be able to have some discussion over the next week, um, you know, and, and maybe learn a little bit more from there. I need a second. Second. Thank you. Any discussion, further discussion on the amended motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the amended motion? So I think that's 6-1, six one, six one. I think. Did you? Well, you have to say who's opposed. <laughs> well, who's opposed? Yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. <I'll> <laughs> um, so now we're back to the main motion as amended, which modifies the 1.6, the 1.050, Councilor Johnson. So just so we're clear, if, if in a week, uh, Todd, can I ask you a question? Is that, Absolutely. okay. Is it possible in a, because we're meeting next week, correct? So is it possible next week that you're gonna, that you can come to us and say, hey, it's actually 1.42 or 1.31 or, where, where are you in the timeline? So again, today we finished our third interview with the company, yep. seeing proposals, why they said what they did. Um, Mike can have to sit down and make a decision or make a recommendation of who okay. we'd like to go with as the proposal, and then we will sit down with that company mm -hmm. at their next early, and I'm, I've already told them that our goal is to have something more finite by the 4th, so i got to get them back here to sit down uh, and tell me exactly where. I guess the question for, that I need guidance is, am I trying to put a proposal that best gets me to that number, which is a, a question I really don't want to ask, Right. Um, yes. or am I trying, absolutely, or am I trying, because I don't, Based on what I know now, 
or am I trying to put the best value that's going to serve the town of Scarborough for 30 years or to meet the number? Because what we know now is different from them for a lot of different reasons. Um, and I apologize from the number is so far off. But just so you know, the way I thought about this process was going through it and then we do this RFP because the, 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 the risk we run is overinflated numbers on the other end when we don't go through a process. So that's why I took the, the way I did. And now I have different information, and that's why I'm bringing it back to you. So just looking for that kind of process in that. We will do our best to identify and bring a recommendation for, for your attention. Uh, I, I think there's other part of the conversation that I'm not able to offer you, but uh, having to do with the uh, approaching safety challenges with the play surfaces and, and not. I'm just not qualified to speak about that. But that's part of the need that I think needs to be part of the conversation. Absolutely. So I think we're back to the amended May motion. Um, any further discussion of that? Is everybody clear? Mm -hmm. All those in favor as the motion as amended? The main motion as amended? I think all those are in favor? Yes. Yeah. Your, your hand was up? Yes. I can okay. do that. Okay. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. I'm just letting you know where I thought the first time. Right. I'm going along the second time. Okay. <laughs> Moving along. Um, moving along, order number 19059, first reading and schedule a public hearing and second reading on the order authorizing issuance of up to 660000 in bonds for a town to fund the cost of a new pumper truck, surf pumper truck surface and place the following question on the November 5th, 2019 ballot. Show the order entitled order authorizing insurance of up to 660000 in bonds of a town to fund the cost of a new pumper truck be approved. Um, so with that, Tom, I don't know if that, well, that was as discussed at the budget process. We have not gone to bed, so I can't sit here and tell you that that number is, is adequate. But uh, at this point, uh, we're prepared to go and seek voter approval at that amount. I have to have faith that uh, the fire chief and the staff have, have vetted that and have a sense that that's adequate for the need. Uh, just uh, for interest sake, this replaces engine two. Uh, it will have 31 years of service should we stand scheduled for replacement. So it's it's provided good value to the town. I just I, I think that number was discussed because it looks it's just, it's, it's it's that is the number that, that was. Number, yeah. okay. It is. I'm just saying we've not gone to bid. So. Oh, I, okay, I see what you're saying. And we should get a nice price on the trade-in since it's an antique. <laughs> <laughs> is, there, is there any public comment on, this, on this issue? Any public comment? Seeing none. Motion to approve. So moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Any comment? Discussion? Uh, one quick comment. Hopefully there's a theme here that uh, when we go through the budgeting process, you know, let's really try to make sure we're tight with the shekels and sharp with the pencil. So, I mean, I, I know stuff happens along the way. We want to be sensitive to that. But uh, the more you can help us understand, you know, a real need, um, the, the easier it'll go. So, but thank you. Um, any further discussion? Mm -mm. Seeing none, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Next order on the agenda is order number 19060. First reading and schedule a second, schedule a public hearing, second reading on the order authorizing the issuance of up to 2.5 million in bonds of the town to fund purchase of land and interest in land throughout the town for purposes of con conservation of natural areas, providing public asset access and recreation, and protection of wildlife habitat and scenic or env environmentally sensitive areas, and to place the following question on the November 5th ballot, which is really just the same thing that I read. So with that, um, Tom, I don't know if you have any updates. We heard a little bit in the public comment that kind of framed it up earlier. Yeah, I evening. believe representatives uh, from the land trust are here who were the lead sponsor, if you will. I know there are also representatives, you heard from one earlier, from the Parks and Conservation Land Board that uh, offered a, a similar letter of support. I see uh, representatives here in the audience. I, I think they're certainly more adequate to speak on behalf of the, the order. If you're willing. Yeah, there's any interest. Does anybody have any questions? Need any additional information? No, I, I guess I guess we're good. So we're good. well, I, I have well, I don't know oh. if it's appropriate time for the question, but um, I, I'm just wondering, uh, how did this one get missed in the planning process? And is there something that are there other areas that maybe we don't engage when we're going through the planning process to, to determine if there there's um, you know something potentially coming down the pipeline? Right. I mean, 
Um, I don't know if you've got, because this was not part of the, the budget process, right? No. This came in sort of recently, the yeah. request. Yeah, I, it, it, I think it's been under consideration for maybe six weeks or so, to my knowledge. Uh, and no, it, uh, in, historically they've not come through the budget process. They've come directly to the council and to the voters. Did you call Should them up? <laughs> they're they're well, a little confused I, I, about I, I where you are. Yeah, yeah, no. I was, uh, did, uh, does anybody have any questions for the land trust? Anybody have? Would you like any additional information? Do you, are you all I'd love well, to I know actually would like to, to provide <laughs> some information okay. if I could. Uh, no. um, one of the things you have to keep in mind with this type of bond is you're not authorizing the money to be spent right now. It took 18 years to spend the $5 million. Um, it took not actually, I had it written down, two th in the year 2000, in the year 2003, and then in 2009 we had these referendums. Um, but we didn't spend the money right away. And so we didn't even spend... In nine years, we didn't spend it. So it's a quite different process than saying we're, we're going out there and we're going to do the turf and we're going to do or we're going to do the fire truck or whatever. Um, so that's the first thing I'll say. Um, the second thing is conserving land is a long-term investment in our quality of life. The benefits of preserving important properties far exceeds the initial cost of acquisition. We're going to put those money, put that information out to you soon. One reason I'm so grateful for the community support for conservation me measures. Um, we've had over, we've had three referendums totaling over five million dollars, and we've protected over a thousand acres of conservation land, and with the support uh, three to one and two to one in those referendums. So it was overwhelming voter recognition of the importance of protecting it. Um, the stories in tomorrow's papers are probably not going to lead with the town of Scarborough Land Bond Fund conserved 1,084 1, acres of valuable wildlife, conservation, and recreational land. Instead, the headlines will probably say the residents are so concerned over their revaluations of their homes and how it will affect their taxes, which is as it should. But actually, the two are intertwined in ways that we can't even... It's hard to, to understand. Um, supporting land conservation is a wise economic strategy for any town. Taxpayers that are concerned about their tax dollars, for instance, um, in order to bond funding land, should be comforted by two things. And these are the two t takeaways I think that I'd like the public to hear about. Um, number one takeaway, conserving land for open space and wildlife protects your property values. Um, when you look for homes, people value that there's nearby property that's either aesthetically pleasing or places they can walk or hike. And then I know I chose to live in Scarborough because of the kinds of character that we had here. Um, in fact, conserving land also protects us from the effects of what's going to be climate change further down. We protect those marshes. We're going to have less cost uh, when, you know, you know, 100 homes go into the ocean as, or into the marsh as opposed to 300 homes, <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, so number one, conserving land protects property values. Number two, development costs money. Residential development costs money. Um, Sean mentioned it. Over the over 20 years of which these are bonded, the benefits of conserving the land far exceed the cost to acquire the land. Fields, forests, saltwater marshes, working farms, riparian habitat, river access, trails, a cranberry bog. These are some of the things that we've already protected. There's so much more. Taking land off the residential market is a net benefit to the community. It is invaluable for an organization also, such as the Scarborough Land Trust or the Maine Farmland Trust, to be able to count on matching funds. Partnerships are how conservation projects happen. And even though we've, we've ourselves, taxpayers, have spent $5 million, we've actually leveraged an additional $4.1 million. I can't see any of your other bonds saying, oh, and we're going to get some federal grant. I mean, sometimes there are actually federal grants for, for things. But that's something that you need to understand. Conservation projects don't work when one person's doing them. Basically, it's a combination. And so we're always leveraging money. So um, those two things. 
open space is a net benefit to this community. Um, we're hoping that you and the entire community will support the continuing efforts of so many people by supporting a land bond referendum for the 2019 ballot. You, you have our recommendation, um, but if you have any questions, Rick is also here. Are you going to come up? Yeah. See I, I do have a question for, no, for oh. both of you, or in, in probably the town manager. Can you explain a little bit so? If we authorize, when do, the, when do we actually have to bond the money? So if, so if you have a project, you'll come to us sometime down the road, and that's when we bond it, Tom? Is that the, when, when do we actually incur debt service on what we're talking about? Well, that's a good question. This is the first time in you know, 20 years where we haven't had anything, um, any authority. Uh, so uh, really to your question, though, depending on the purchase, uh, you know, the Pleasant Hill Preserve was a, a million dollar all at once, so we would have difficulty floating that, but smaller purchases I think we've been able to do it through cash and then we replenish our, uh, our reserves with, with bond proceeds. Uh, the good news is most of the real estate transactions uh, have somewhat of a lead time, so they're not uh, terribly fast paced, so we have time to react and plan for it. So does each one of those withdrawals or draw on the fund have to come in front of the town council? Town council approves every single dime spent of it, yes. As it goes forward. Yeah, it, it always has, and we would certainly okay. continue that practice. Okay. And do you, do you have any sense? I mean, we're really trying to look ahead at what our capital needs are going to be and when they fall in debt service. Do you have any projects in mind or any concept of when these funds might be needed? I mean, are they sometime in the next 20 years, or are they sometime in the next three years? Well, let me start by identifying myself. I'm uh, Rick Cheney, and I'm president <laughs> of the Scarborough Land Trust, serving with pride. Um, as Sue said and the manager said, um, this bond issue, unlike the others that you've discussed tonight, really should be looked at more in terms of an authorization from the voters if they approve it to the council that you're authorized to spend mm -hmm. or to issue bonds to generate money to be spent up to two and a half million dollars if and when an opportunity arises whether it be the land trust coming to you for funds or the town on its own initiative seeking to buy land or easements or the Friends of the Scarborough Marsh conceivably needing money. This is not money for the land trust. It's money that the town, the council would be authorized to spend on projects that the council deems worthy, but only after Sue's committee has vetted the projects as well and approved them. For example, the Blue Point Preserve, which the council did uh, uh, approve recently, and I'm not sure of the mechanics, but bonds presumably have been or will be uh, issued to fund that. Sue's committee reviewed that project very carefully, made a recommendation to the council. You considered her recommendation, um, discussed it, and, and ultimately approved it. So every project that might, might come up for which these funds would be um, needed for goes through Sue's committee, it's the, the Parks and Conservation Land Board, and if, well, I wouldn't say, the committee could conceivably come back with a negative recommendation, but it's, it's to you one way or the other, and then you, you, you vote on whether or not to spend that money. So it's unlike the other bonds, where if approved, you'll float the bonds, incur the debt, more or less immediately. This is more in the nature of an authorization for potential future expenditures. To answer the, the chair's question, we have no immediate projects at the trust level that we have gotten to the point where we've ag agreed to buy land or buy an easement or anything of that nature. There are some that we're looking at. We're looking at things all the time, um, but nothing specific. The only project that is, is uh, going to close soon is Blue Point uh, Preserve. And that, of course, you've already um, contributed money towards. So um, Sue's letter and my letter that were in your packages um, talk a lot about the past bond issues. 
and, and make the financial case for why land conservation is good for a community and in fact probably uh, helps everybody by um, increasing the value of their properties when they're sold. Um, I don't want to talk so much about the numbers. What I want you to think about tonight is the value of open space available for public access to the citizens of this town. You only have to look at Pleasant Hill Preserve off the Pleasant Hill Road, Libby River Farm off the Black Point Road, uh, Fuller Farm off the Broad Turn, the Fuller Preserve off the, uh, the Broad Turn Road, Broad Turn Farm, a working farm that would not be where it is today were it not for the cooperation between the town and the Scarborough Land Trust to acquire that property and prevent it from being developed and make it possible for it to be a continuing real working farm. There have been many studies that show that there is great value both physically, mentally, I would say spiritually for getting outside, away from our computers, out on the land, walking the trails. If, if you doubt the value of that, I would highly recommend you read the book called The Nature Fix by Florence Williams. You can get it on Audible. You can get it on Amazon. It's not very expensive. I have two copies, and I'm happy to lend you my, one of mine. The library has it. Read that book, and you will realize the, the critical importance of open space available for public access. Mm -hmm. So we're asking you tonight to support this um, referendum question, let the citizens decide whether they agree for a fourth time that putting aside money, making it available to preserve land, to create open space, to create these beautiful areas where people can get away from it all. And God knows what's happened tonight, and I, I applaud you all for your service and what you do and what you have to deal with. It's a, there's a lot of value in getting away from it all and getting out into nature. So we strongly recommend that you support this question, um, and we hope that the voters will do the same in November. Thank you very much. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question for the manager. It's just quick, quick the uh, historic preservation mm -hmm. portion. Um, so, because I'm the liaison of the Historic Preservation Committee, if something came up, these funds could be available for that also? Generally speaking, yes. In okay. fact, uh, the, the resources you put toward the uh, um, foundation work and the roof repair at the Beach Ridge School would be a good example of that. I believe this, uh, this list of allowed uses has been consistent since uh, the beginning. And I think it's intentionally broad, but it also has a fairly direct focus in terms of how the funds are to be used. Councilor yeah, I, I'm happy to support this tonight, and um, my only, I guess, pause is simply, I know in the past, I mean, I, most people know Sue's my sister, um, and my much older sister, and, um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I had to, I don't know, that. but, um, you know, I've seen her work tirelessly um, over many, many years on uh, conservation issues around town. And I know it, and I see it, and I recognize it as a very uh, strong strategic economic development plan in, in and of itself. Um, and I, I know they've been very strategic about leveraging uh, what they've been able to do with the money. And as you said, she five million dollars over 18 years. So, giving the authorization for this doesn't mean they're going to, you know, go out there and find 10 projects to go in the next two years. Um, but I would just challenge both the, the land trust and, and folks interested in uh, supporting this kind of work to get out there and help campaign because I know in the past there was a lot of legwork done in advance of putting something like this on the ballot and I think uh, in these times, as you've heard tonight, where people are really concerned about um, you know, budgets and money, you know, it's going to be important that uh, people understand why it is such uh, a great, important strategy and a strength for the town. So, so before we...
pivot, I think. Um, we're back at public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so sorry. Um, if there's anybody that would like to speak to this, please step forward and, again, name and address and share with us your thoughts. I'm Stephanie Smith, and I am president of the board of the Friends of Scarborough Marsh. Um, and I'm not going to take a long time because everybody else who's spoken has given you facts and figures and, and all of that. But without the support of the land bond and the town, um, protection for some of the upland edge of the marsh, particularly the Jarvis property, which was acquired a few years back, and partially um, we have been working with the land trust on a part of what is now Blue Point Preserve. They have added to that, but we are their partner in some part of it, and certainly that would not have happened without the help of the, of the, the last land bond and the, and the town. So my, we, we really appreciate the kind of support that we've gotten for the marsh from this body and would encourage uh, both this reading and the second reading being passed so that it goes on the ballot in November. And I agree, we'll try to do what we can to make sure that we can campaign for this bond. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm Sue Hamill, 3 Bay Street. You know that Scarborough already has $100 million in debt. And we have a much higher per debt per capita than most other towns, possibly all other towns in Maine. We know we're going to be building a new elementary school very soon to the tune of 60 to $75 million. The library is coming to us for an $8 million expansion. We're, we talked about a community center tonight. You can see that with all these big items, we're going to be doubling our town debt very quickly. And with that increased debt comes increased debt service and much higher tax increases. Some of the projections show that our tax <clears throat> increases could approach 14% in just two years if these projects all take place. The land trust is asking for $2.5 million, and it is a worthy cause. They've conserved, according to their website, 1,600 acres, which is over 5% of Scarborough's land. We recognize them as worthy, and we've already provided them with $5 million from bond issues since 2001. But we can't do everything we want. The council needs to take the time needed to do a thorough analysis of what our upcoming capital needs are and their tax effects and establish priorities. Clearly, the school will be in first position. It's unclear what else will make the cut. Please don't put this land bond issue on the ballot in November. Do the work necessary to set the priorities and forecast tax rates. It is just not prudent financial management to put it up there. At the very least, why is it two and a half million? Why couldn't it be $500,000? Why do we have to start with an issue, a bond issue, bigger than any that they've ever received before. Thanks. Good evening, my name is Rachel Hendrickson and I live on Two Plantation Drive and I am on the Parks and Conservation Land Board. Uh, one of the things I, I want to talk to you about is uh, what happened during Summerfest. Um, some of you know me in my role as an activist in the Democratic Party here in Scarborough. One of the things that we did in Summerfest is we held a visual straw poll of folks going by asking them what was important to them in Scarborough. What was on their mind? What were they thinking about? And while education came at the very top of those issues, the interesting and close very close second in that straw poll was energy and environmental policy. The folks in Scarborough are concerned very much about how we treat our environment. And the conversations that I had with those people who came by 
really address the issue of what was going to be there for their children. Not just what was there today, but what were they leaving for their children. We're asking for two and a half million dollars. We don't spend that all at once. We wait until somebody comes forward with a proposal. And then the land board spends a lot of time examining that proposal. Is it of value to the people of Scarborough? Are they asking us, is somebody asking us really to make a, an investment that's going to be good for the future of Scarborough, for the environment, and for its children? We're asking you to say, have some faith and say at some point we will issue bonds up to two and a half million dollars when the time is right, when a proposal comes forward that really addresses the needs of Scarborough. So I do ask that you put that on the ballot for November. Thank you. Anybody else wishing to speak this evening? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Second. Uh, discussion? I already made all my comments. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I uh, agree with everything that, that's, or most of, of what's been said. I, I fully support, uh, you know, having the mechanism to conserve more land in Scarborough and um, the opportunity that's created by having funds available um, for matching funds from other organizations is critical. Um, my only comment, and I alluded to it earlier, is I wish that we would have contemplated this during the budget um, season and, and hopefully that we can learn and other organizations that might be out there that, that come to us for this, these types of funds uh, it would hopefully be able to be aligned with the, the budgeting and planning process. So, thank you. Councilor Johnson. Um, <clears throat> well, I think with the budget process, it's for the next fiscal year, so to speak, and this is unique in nature. So I understand why this is off cycle in a sense. And to me, this is the easiest decision I've made all night, except for uh, nothing but cakes. So. <laughs> I support it. <laughs> I, was, I lied. I have one more piece. Is, and that is that, you know, one of the things I bring I, or I take comfort in in a proposal like this is the fact that it, it's not, they don't come back to us for the full amount and that each project is individually vetted um, very thoroughly in terms of what we can expect uh, in terms of value and return, um, you know, and they're, they've been very... Um, prudent in spending it responsibly, so. Also, Katarina? Yeah, I will support this uh, for all of the reasons that have been elucidated uh, by the other counselors. Um, I also, I don't see this as spending money, I see it as an investment. I see it as an investment in our environment and our children and our future, so. Um, and it, and I know they've handled uh, the past bond very responsibly. Uh, the councils uh, it vetted everything that came before them. Uh, there's public process, so uh, I'm fine with this. Council John? Yeah, I strongly support this uh, uh, for both the environmental protection aspects, uh, which we're sorely in need of upgrading in this country uh, for the contribution to community life which I think is wonderful, and I've really enjoyed in recent years walking and hiking those trails. Uh, and for the growth management, if you kind of put our policy hats on uh, here, it's one of the best growth management uh, tools that we have to make sure that we're balancing uh, what's good economically for Scarborough. Council Hill. Yeah, sorry to part with my colleagues here, but uh, I I am a big fan of Scarborough Land Trust and the great work they've done. You know, Rick and Sue and others, uh, uh, they use their money wisely. I supported the purchase of the Blue Point School property. I understand you need lead time and deals present themselves when they when they come about, and there's no real idea of when that happens. They happen suddenly, so you have to be funded. This, however, still falls in line with the, the big cliff we're looking at, you know, and it's two and a half million dollars. It's still got to fit somehow in the queue with other things that we're talking about uh, that we're looking at in the in the immediate future. So I am I'm not going to support this, um, uh, 
and for those reasons. Um, and I guess where I am, and kind of really torn, same thing, I really support the land trust and all the work. I certainly enjoy all the properties. I do have a growing concern, and I think it's been somewhat addressed. I mean, we're looking at just tonight $5 million worth of additional debt that's being added. That's, that's, a, that, that's a 5 percent increase from where we are. And I look at what we're talking about. We're talking about a new primary school that was mentioned that we don't know what the numbers are, but somewhere between 60 and 80 million in two to three years. You know, I've heard as, as high a number as $11 million for library expansion. I've heard of numbers for a community center of if we build it up 25 to 30 million, then we're trying to accelerate that. I would, I would support this being on the June ballot because then I think we're going to have a much better, the school's going to let us know where they are with the school building process. They don't know now. They think by December they will. Um, I'm just uncomfortable adding all of this on to preloading the debt. Um, I, I, I fully support purchasing land in, in Scarborough. I think the timing's off. I do have a concern that if all three of these things are on the ballot this November, I really worry that something's not going to get passed. You know, there may be two out of three. Um, I think it's, I was surprised at the timing of when this was, I mean, this just appeared, as Tom said, in the last couple of weeks, so this isn't really, um, so my concern is three things on the ballot in November, given the mood of the community right now, based on what you just heard tonight, I really get nervous. So I, I don't think I'll support it tonight. I will support it later in the process when we have more definitive answers about where we're going. So with that, any other further comment? I think we're ready for vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Thank you. Um, order number 19061, we've already talked about. Um, although we didn't do a roll call, did we? we um, Order number 19062, act on the request from the police department to receive an anonymous donation in the amount of 3600 for a new speed radar sign for Pine Point area. Tom, you have any? I think you I don't have, I didn't put that material out, but um, we have had a similar offer, generous offer from residents of Pine Point in, in years past and have enjoyed great success. And uh, the same group has, um, identified funds and, and wants to move forward with the purchase of another speed control sign and uh, there is a memo or excuse me a letter uh, in your packet that explains a bit of that um, again our experience with uh, doing this in the past has been very positive and, and we would look forward to working with them in, in the future as well uh, I was going to say anybody from the public want to comment but the, it, it's emptied out uh, seeing none uh, motion to approve so moved second any discussion? All those in favor? Thank you. Um, order number 19063, act to authorize the town manager to sign documents authorizing acceptance of $1,565.70 or any portion thereof to place in the asset forfeiture account. This money is the police department's equitable share for its contribution in an investigation of a criminal case. That's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Or I, I really don't have anything to add. I think uh, Deputy Chief O'Malley provided some fairly good documentation in support of this, uh, this matter, and we do recommend you approve it. Is there any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, motion to approve. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Amendments. Next item is non-action item, and item number 10 is standing committee reports. Um, Don, I don't know if you want to start from your end. Yes, thanks very much. Um, um, I just wanted to update on uh, finance committee activity primarily, and uh, um, we rely on Peter and uh, Paul to add to that as well. But we, we had a second in a series of joint uh, finance committees with the Board of Ed. These have been fairly informal. Um, Tom joined us as well. Um, we were discussing uh, approaches to the current the, the future budget season, and um, there's been a good discussion about uh, different approaches. Paul introduced the concept of a rubric, trying to be a little broader with um, how we approach goal setting. We also talked a lot about the sequencing and how it's very difficult for, for Tom and also for the schools to know exactly where they 
uh, where they will be at a first reading. So we're going to reconvene again in September and come back with some suggestions of what we might do process-wise to help uh, the schools, you know, tell us what timing would work better for them and what meetings we may need to uh, to do that. So um, encouraged by that, and uh, other counselors have attended. John's been a regular attendee, and uh, we value and welcome his continued participation in those. So we're happy about that, and I think it's very healthy that we're getting a, an early start and having a nice dialogue about it. So that's about it in terms of my committee assignments. Yeah, yeah. given the lateness of the hour, I'll report next. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, yes. Uh, we will have an appointments committee meeting um, next Tuesday. What are you going to talk about? Are we not posting a name? Uh, are we posting a name? Yes. Thank yes. Thank you. Uh, give me a minute to dig up my uh, okay. email. <laughs> you know, the clerk or why just mention the, the name? Uh, oh. Come back to me. Come back um, to me. So, Don, while you're looking that up, yeah, Council Don is going to pass the next time. <laughs> Council Katarina, yeah. uh, I just want to remind people there's an ordinance meeting tomorrow at 4 o'clock, and the only agenda item is marijuana. Um, what we're, we have some draft rules that are up online. Um, any feedback? Come to the meeting is appreciated. Dawn and I both went to a Maine Municipal training on it. Seems like years ago, but I guess it was last <laughs> week. <laughs> but um, just wanted to put that out for folks. That's it. Thank you. Councilor Foley? I have none. Councilor Johnson? All set. Okay. All set? I'm all set too. So with that, uh, I guess Dawn still will come. Well, well there's a second alternate to the. Um, Energy Committee for Sustainability Committee with a term to expire in December 2020. Sorry about my voice. Could you repeat the name? I'm not sure if I'm. Ernest Milner, M, M I L N E R, as second alternate to the Sustainability Committee. And we're doing that as a. We're posting his name this evening and we'll approve it at the next meeting of the board and the town council meeting. Tom, Tom Andrew. Yes, very quickly, and uh, given the lateness of the hour, I, I do want to reiterate what I said at the top of the meeting. Uh, we are on schedule um, to move forward with the tax commitment at the end of the week. Uh, everything is tracking in that direction. Um, that will put in, in motion, of course, uh, the due dates and, and like that we've talked about earlier. I uh, just want to be clear on that. Next Wednesday, um, there is another mediation uh, with the Piper Shores exemption matter. This is a, I see this as a good move in terms of them requesting us to come back together that suggests to me that uh, there's something to talk about. And I think a lot of that might have to do with the fact that uh, there was an abatement that was kind of confusing the discussion last time that's been, uh, I believe, sorted through or, or uh, is likely to be sorted through. So I'm hopeful to report back. We really have no authorization, so uh, the mediator is aware of that. Um, but we'll certainly bring back to you whatever information um, comes from that. Lastly, the Beechwood School came to mind in a prior discussion. Uh, I've not been up there recently, but I do know that uh, the structure's been moved uh, to off, uh, on the site, but uh, away from the foundation, new foundations in place. And so that work is progressing nicely. Um, and we've had good coordination through the Historical Society to make sure that uh, their, their contractors and vendors are, are uh, performing well and being paid on time. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Four counselors here, Councilors Johnson, Foley, Hamill, and uh, excuse me, Donovan, uh, for helping support the Explorers program. There was a golf tournament, mm -hmm. seems like years ago. Uh, and I very much appreciate, I know uh, the members of the, uh, the association and certainly the police department, uh, that, that did not go unnoticed. So I appreciate your support. I understand Councillor Donovan got a hole in one. Yeah, that was going to be in my council comments. That's why I said that. Yeah. <laughs> I was refraining from that reference, but uh, I, I, truly, we do appreciate that, and hopefully, we can make that a tradition where the council is able to be involved. Thank you. So, with that, Councillor comments, maybe starting on that end of the table. Uh, yeah, no, I've uh, attended a, a bunch of meetings and, and have enjoyed it, but. Uh, you know, top of the mind has been the revaluation and, uh, you know, listening to the concerns that have been voiced. 
Um, I, I acknowledge and certainly agree that there's a lot of improvements that can be made, and I, I think you'd look at any process and you should be able to say that, but in particular in this case, I, I think we can do better, and, um, and I hope we do. Uh, that having been said, there's been a lot of information put out there uh, that calls into question the process and the data that was used, and I, I do have a background in data management and data quality, and uh, it, I can say that what I've seen in, in looking at the data here isn't unlike what I've seen in other places. I don't think it's um, horrendous, and uh, the anomalies that I see, uh, when you're talking about 8,800 properties, even 1,000 of those, you know, or, or, you know, just over 10 percent, is uh, it's significant to those people, but you have to remember that there's 90 percent that are probably pretty good in a good place. So, uh, you know, I don't know exactly what the threshold is to move forward, but I, I know the assessor spends a lot of time looking at all different cuts to make sure that we're being equitable. It doesn't necessarily that it mean that you have to be accurate in any specific instance, but you want to be equally accurate um, for everybody. Uh, so that, that's the intent, and I, I think a good job has been done under duress to get us to the right place. Um, and I think we will wind up at the right place at the end of the process. So, and if you think that uh, the value that is presented to you is, is uh, lower than what you would reasonably sell your home for, you should contact the assessor's department and, uh, and have a discussion. Or yeah. higher. Yeah. <laughs> the assessed value is higher, yeah, sorry. <laughs> You can, you, can, you can contact them if, if you're not paying well. enough, we'll take more. Yeah. 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 There may be a lot of quiet on that. Yeah. <laughs> Councilor Dennison? Uh, I would just echo what John said, though. You know, that's not easy to sit through, and, and there's, I, I, I think that everybody is genuinely making an effort to correct the instances that are out of whack. There are instances that are out of whack. Um, I actually, during the golf tournament, I played golf for four and a half hours with our tax assessor. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's fair to say that he's going to be a magician for everybody because that's not a reasonable expectation. So I'm not saying that. But what I do know from talking to him is he is acutely aware of the situation and he wants to make it right for the, for the people that should be made right. Um, so that gives me some solace to this. Um, I understand that the process is also uh, anxiety inducing and intimidating for some of those. So, I mean, the best thing I can say is, you know, my, my phone number is post it on the website, call me, I'll come sit with you, I'll come pick you up, and we'll do it together. Um, I know that it's a little bit daunting, um, but it is easy if you do it early. So I just hope people do it early. Um, and Bill does still owe a lot of uh, rounds in the clubhouse because I think, I don't think he bought any after his hole in one, but I've never seen a guy so unimpressed with his hole in one. It was like he did it every day. He's like, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, well done. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't want to be too um, repetitive, but you know, as I've thought through um, the reval pieces and, and thinking about what I, again what I see out there in terms of real estate, you know, I've met with many many sellers, uh, and I'm sure Jean Marie has as well over the last year, who have said, "Shh, don't tell the town," and I kind of say. I chuckle and say, you know I am on the council, right? I'm like, I'm not going to tell the assessor necessarily, but a lot of folks that I've met with, they knew they were very undervalued um, and that they hadn't been paying their full value. So I'm not saying taking away from people's concerns and complaints. Um, I wa want to add, um, I, I do think the Hillcrest community in, is in particularly a challenge. And I hope that they understand and realize that part of the challenge there, too, is that that sales data is not readily available like it is for all other uh, residential property and listings. So I had a listing in there, and I had a really hard time comping the property out because I couldn't actually get the data because it was not sold as real estate. Um, and that's a problem uh, in terms of the value. You want the highest dollar when you turn to sell, but, you know, not necessarily. Uh -huh. And so there's a balance to be struck. Um, and then wanted to uh, thank folks for uh, encouraging us to join a, in the uh, golf tournament I hadn't played in a few years. It was fun to get out there. Um, my goal was just that my scramble team would use two of my balls, and we ended up using seven. So I felt very good about my um, performance. Seven. Six. All right. I exaggerate, you know. Uh, he was on my team. And I know I'm on it. I believe our team, Councillor Johnson and I, did come in ahead of um, 
manager oh, Tom Hall and Bill Donovan, even with the hole in one. So just had wow. to throw that out there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Councilor Katarina. Um, <clears throat> I probably talked enough tonight, but I would add one thing too that people need to remember with this whole reval that the mill rate that will be set will be lower. Uh, it will be. I consider significantly lower. I see uh, mill rates every day in my business, and I know people don't want to hear this, but we do have one of the lowest mill rates for a similar type of town, and it's going to go lower. So, you know, it's a balance. You know, our, our, we've got high values. People want to live here. Our real estate is valuable. Um, <coughs> But we do have a reasonable mill rate because we, I think we do a darn good job of keeping a good, um, balanced economic base and staying on top of things. So that's it for me. Uh, I'll be short. Uh, I have done for decades uh, property tax abatement work for clients. So uh, I'd be happy if there's anyone in town who's a little intimidated by this process, uh, sit with you and David Buffard. Uh, uh, and uh, see if we can make your make you more comfortable with this outcome. Thank you, you. Councilor Hill. Yeah, I, I uh, am in, uh, encouraged by uh, the spirit and the effort of the council to uh, to take another another crack at the measures that we might be able to to bring forward to try to help uh, remediate some of the issues that people are are experiencing with the tax uh, appraisal. Uh, so I, I'm going to be coming back with some ideas, to, and I'm going to be—I'm not sharing them with folks tonight, and I'm not going to give it for you. But I'm going to be meeting with folks one-on-one -on -one that will hopefully address some of the reinforcement of the efforts that we've committed to already, but also some other things that will provide us with some analysis, so we can actually feel comfortable about sanctioning the results and filling in wherever we may need to in terms of other measures. So. Uh, I, I really appreciate the commentary that folks had about uh, that interest rate. Uh, uh, motion that uh, that was approved, but uh, also a commitment to kind of take another pass at it. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I did. I want to take a minute just to read one thing. I've read every single one of these emails coming from people. And uh, this fellow is a KRT guy, so I'm, hopefully he has some good news based upon the last adjustments. But he, he, for me, in one paragraph, really conveyed the feeling, I think, of a lot of people. This is a fellow who is an 80-year-old guy. Uh, he attended uh, our finance committee meeting a week or two ago. Uh, he's a Hillcrest resident, Mr. Gen Genicio. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I'm reading from this because it was sent to us and it's in the public realm, but I, it, it was particularly, uh, it really hit me when I read it. Uh, Marine veteran. I played by the rules my entire life, honorably serving my country in uniform continuously maintaining gainful employment, obeying federal, state, and local laws and municipal ordinances, serving on local boards and committees, responsibly raising a family, meeting all of my financial obligations in a timely manner, and never expecting more than I had earned. I believe the severity of the, the draconian reassessment is a violation and betrayal of a mutual agreement that has existed between members of my generation and a higher authority at all levels I have honored my side of that agreement in every instance, and I appeal to those who occupy seats of authority in the town of Scarborough to honor theirs. So I, I think we have an obligation to people like this and to others who feel wronged by the process that may not have really helped ease the pain, in fact, may have made it worse in some cases. So that, that's hopefully, I, I hope we can remember that as we you know, take another pass at this next, week, next Wednesday. Great. And I guess I'll just conclude with thanking everybody. It has been a somewhat, I, and I think, Councillor Johnson, I'll blame you. you. You jinxed us at one point, saying it's been a really quiet summer, and you were kind of celebrating <laughs> celebrating that. I think that's that's changed. So thanks, everyone. And I think with that, is there a motion to adjourn? So Second. Thanks, everyone. All those in favor? Thank you, everyone. What? You were?